you know, there's another idea floating around that's similar now, and it's exciting. It's called embodied cognition. Mm -hmm. And strangely, this comes from the world of robotics and artificial intelligence. And they, they've discovered that you can't just build a robot with a brain that works top down. Yep. You have to have a feedback system. Front. The robot has to have a body, I, and the body has to participate in the development of the, of the brain. It's a distributed computing sort of thing. Distributed intelligence. Yes, and people right. start to realize that the body feeding into the limbic system, the emotional centers of the brain, it's all about rapport. It's all about conversation. One example is the nervous system that's contained within the gut. There are millions of neurons. After the brain, this is the most uh, uh, neurologically dense part of the body. And there's an immense amount of computing that's going on here and neurotransmitter conversations back and forth between the gut and the brain. And to, to divorce that from our decision-making process is just crazy. Right. But that's our culture. Right? So now... Uh, you know, I've read it. I've read some of the uh, you know Eastern mysticism, the Eastern thought, you know, so on the the yin yang thing. What it what is that all about, and how does it relate to this? Well, I think that comes out of a native indigenous world view, a cosmology that is very reluctant to chop things into bits, and is always looking at a holistic orientation whenever possible. Mm -hmm. um, all the anthropology I've read, the same theme comes up again and again. They'll, they'll talk to the researcher, the anthropologist, and say, well, yes, it's, it's the mind, it's the body, it's all of these things. It's habitat, it's culture. So what we see out of China and Japan is similar to what we see out of Australia and Africa and North America. All of these cosmologies, I think, are very integrative. Mm -hmm. And... The idea of yin and yang is just one more example of that, mm -hmm. that um, we're looking for a unity of experience. A unity sort of a thing, right. Uh, you have some um, um, training jams, I think you call them, uh, right. uh, coming up. Tell us about those. When, and, up, when and where? And Coming up in October, we've got one in Seattle and one on the East Coast, and they're modeled on... Uh, the old martial art concept of doing a uh, what they call a goskew, which is a, a weekend training jam. So we, we get together and we start training on Friday evening and we do a couple of movement sessions and some presentations and then we train all day Saturday and um, about a three-quarter day on Sunday so people have time to, to start getting home. Uh -huh. but, um, it, it's pretty intense training in the sense that we, we have a lot of movement. There'll be probably six or eight hours of movement spread out over that time and a lot of great presentations and a lot of great um, just tribe building during that time. One of the most interesting or, or novel or, uh, or unique uh, things that I, re I recall seeing was when you have, I forget the term you use for it, but, but you base, there's partners and you're basically, you know, messing with them. <laughs> right. Well, there's, there's um, what we do there is called heckling. Heckling, that's it. Yes. <laughs> and heckling is it, it's actually a sophisticated concept. It, it doesn't sound that way from the from the word, but we mess with people's stability. And it turns out if you're a physical therapist or an athletic trainer, you're really interested in the stability of the body, especially in motion, because you need to stabilize certain segments of the body if you're going to produce powerful movement. If, you, if the body's too sloppy or, or segments are asleep, then you can't really produce athletic movement. So we destabilize one another, which has the benefit of promoting fitness and, and the body's intelligence, but it's also super fun. Yeah, and, and, and the, thing, the, 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 the interesting thing about it is, you know, you could... You could try to devise a routine to help your st st stabilization and, you know, try to get yourself off balance. But, but you know what you're going to be doing, right? If it's right. coming from someone else, then it's unexpected. You don't know what the next move is. 
Right, and people introduce this element of surprise and novelty, which is important for the brain. The more, the more surprise and novelty you experience, the more you pay attention, and it really develops the nervous system. So the heckling is really important. We also do a similar thing called partner resist, where we pick out a movement, and your partner now provides resistance to that movement. It's... Um, it's what I call a cooperative contest. Mm -hmm. And you can do actual strength training with people who provide that resistance. And it's very rich. I mean, it's, it's a really exciting concept. And it, um, it's also a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the functional carryover of doing really heavy weights doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Because it's not a grassland thing. It's not a primal thing. I mean, maybe you might have to lift a heavy rock or a heavy animal on occasion. But when I was in Africa, I didn't see the pe you know the native peoples doing that kind of thing. It's mostly you know primal environments that the survival demands are mostly about locomotion and basic movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't have to squat a thousand pounds to succeed as a hunter gatherer, for example. So, I, I think it, it can become a movement specialty. Okay. And There's one other thing that I wanted to cover. You put up a slide and you said, this is where science began. Oh, so, well, if you, if you think about the first hunter-gatherer who looked at the track of an animal and said, this means this. This is a stand-in for that. This is an abstraction for that, for that animal, I can follow that, that track and I can make inferences and I can make predictions about where that animal is going. That was a pivotal moment in human history. What, Prior kind, to what that, kind of animal is it versus a different kind? What? I mean, I started thinking about this. I mean, that is, and I, I said, I, I actually gave a little, um, 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 I did a little video, I think last last Friday, where I said I'm going to be doing this and this and this. And one of the things uh, was uh, was uh, that I had mentioned was uh, talking with uh, Frank uh, uh, Fursenich, and uh, I mispronounced your name in that video. By the way, <laughs> I've got this mind block. <laughs> oh, right, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I said Fursenich instead of um, Forensic. So it's that's all right. So sorry about that. But uh, but yeah. Um, it was, uh, uh, when I saw that, I thought, man, maybe, I mean, you could, you could probably, there's, there, you, there's arguments you could make about, you know, what I'm sure, you know, we made inferences about things earlier than that, but this is, this is the whole ball of wax in terms of, uh, in terms of, of, of survival and venturing out from the, um, from you know the tree or the the forest or the or even the forest or even the uh, campfire or or whatnot, right. and 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 not only that but the cooperation with the other uh, uh, with the other people in the tribe. Yes, absolutely. Communication, uh, specialization, uh, different things like that. Yeah, yeah, um, and and who knows when that first occurred when they first made that hookup between the track on the ground and what it meant for them and their survival. So it may have been a hundred thousand years ago. Yeah. Homo you know, sapiens. Go ahead. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's bringing, it's bringing more senses into it because, you know, animals hunt by sight. They hunt by hearing, they hunt by smell, in, smell. you know, in, in particular. So I'm sure that we, at times we, we, we could have, any any one of those different things like you hear a rustle oh there's there's food over there right but this puts it all together this t puts it all together and really brings the mind into it which which differentiates us from from uh, from um, lower animals I should say right right you know the other pivotal moment may have been um, when we first realized that the circling vultures out over the grasslands indicated that there was a kill and that we would be able to run and find a, a killed animal there. I mean, that was another um, cognitive uh, development, I think, for people where we first made that hookup. And it, I bet it happened about the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it's really interesting when you consider uh, um, uh, today 
uh, how many, well, I would venture to say billions of people in the world, if you put them out into that environment, like you say you put a group of 20 of them out there, um, I think they'd be hard pressed to, uh, to as, as, even, if they, even if they had uh, advanced science degrees, they might be hard pressed to, to, to uh, uh, go back and, and use that primitive sort of science and survive. Right. Because, because a lot of things enter, it's not just about getting the animal, it's being in the right place at the right time it, and, and um, using your energy wisely, using your resources wisely, right. all of these things. Well, not only that, but having an oral tradition that carries the knowledge of the tribe forward. There's a great book called The Old Way by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. And she actually lived, she actually grew up, her, her parents were anthropologists in, um, in Botswana. And they studied the, uh, the Juasi, the San Bushman. And she tells a, a bit about the poison on the arrows that the Bushmen would kill animals with and where that poison came from. And it turns out the poison comes from the larva of a particular insect that only grows at the base of a particular tree in a particular season. So somehow, somebody not only had to figure that out, but to keep that alive within the oral tradition of the tribe so that people would continue to know how to do this. And that's something that even our greatest athletes, if we put them in the time machine and put them back into the paleo, they wouldn't know that. They wouldn't be able to figure that out. You have to have some continuity between the, uh, right. the generations. So wow. it's, uh, it's amazing. That is. That is. Um, so, I mean, to, to, to wrap this up, you're... Um, um, I, I, I'm sure you know uh, Erwin Lacour and, and sure. MoveNet and, and everything. And there's a, there's a lot of parallel. I've done the MoveNet course. You know, it was it was a, an amazing week. Um, but one of the things that he always likes to emphasize is he's like, don't get don't get me wrong. You know, I'm a modern man. I, you know, <laughs> I I like the the comforts. This is not about this is not about um, um, uh, celebrating the primitive to be primitive. It's about studying the primitive and, and, and in, in many ways, in many ways, um, identifying what we've lost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and try to integrate that into our modern lives so that, so that we are more of a whole animal who moves correctly, eats correctly, sleeps correctly, um, so on. Right. Yeah, I agree with that totally. I mean, that's, that's the challenge. There is no going back to the paleo. Um, we have to find a way to learn the lessons of the paleo and to create some new new life for ourselves in the modern world that's sustainable and and interesting and pleasurable so it, there's a lot we can learn there and that, i think this is what we're doing you know this, yep. this paleo group so all right well frank all, it's a, it was a pleasure uh, meeting you in particular. I've, I, as I, the other thing I mentioned in that video is that you're one of the guys that, you know, my blog, Free the Animal, I think it was, you originally contacted me way back when you must have stumbled on it and, and, and realized that, that, that it's, not just, it's not just a diet and exercise thing. I, you know, and, and I, blog, I, I blog also every now and then on other aspects of you know society that I think have have totally detached us and you know one of my particular things is 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 uh, is you know about the whole way society you know gets all uh, you know riled up about the news mm -hmm. you know in advance of the next election <laughs> and I, so you know I, I mean I, I think it's hilarious how people get all excited about going on election day to, what I, I always say, get there, get your one in three hundred million say in your own affairs, and how <laughs> how 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 ridiculous that would seem to a hunter gatherer living in a tribe of thirty to fifty people, where they right. where we I, what I always say is we evolved to account for the actions and values of thirty to fifty other people. Number right. one, number two, is we actually had a real shot at influencing the behavior of the whole group. And, right. and today, it's just, it's just this big, and, and you, would, you would feel real power 
in that sort of a setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, people people act like they have all this power because they vote. <laughs> and it's hilarious. To oh, uh, uh, till next time. We'll do this again sometime, Frank. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and and uh, I hope some people come out to your uh, to workshops. Yeah, West Coast, East Coast. So you don't you're not going to have to go far unless you're in Chicago.